Good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Chris Van Tyn, Chief Technologist for the West Region at Red Hat, and I've been with Red Hat for about 12 years. I work with uh, strategic partners and customers up and down the coast who are adopting uh, Red Hat's emerging technologies. You know, Red Hat has certainly moved well beyond Linux into middleware, virtualization, container and cloud management. And one of the hot topics is certainly about enabling companies to deliver capabilities quicker to the marketplace. And ultimately, that discussion usually leads to a I talk about DevOps and enabling technologies such as containers, container management. And with that transformation, there's a lot of implications around security. So we'll touch on some of those uh, today in the talk. So first off, uh, you know, about 20 years ago or so, Andy Grove talked about how only the paranoid survive. You know, it's not a sec uh, about security, but it's about inflection points in the market when there's huge disruption, huge amounts of change, a company has to make a decision. Do they adapt uh, with the potential to thrive, or do they uh, stay as is and fall by the wayside, potentially? And as we've seen in the marketplace, you know, software is a disruption right now in many different industries, whether it's retail, finance, media, or transportation. And software is having a huge impact. And putting a lot of pressure on IT to not become the bottleneck and keep pace. Um, and so there's a movement towards uh, DevOps in terms of how applications are developed and a movement towards containers in terms of enabling applications to easily move from dev tests into production. And DevOps is all about you know, a cultural shift, uh, bringing together uh, siloed organizations, typically dev test and operations and bring them together. Also in terms of process, implementing uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, pipeline, uh, and then also the enabling technology. With CICD, uh, typically open source solutions are being leveraged to build out this automation software factory to deliver software rapidly for the business and enable innovation. Uh, you know, in terms of security though, um, that's a missing piece on that slide. And it's an important piece. Uh, typically, when I had met with customers early in my early days at Red Hat, they would s talk about security. They would say, well, we really don't patch our servers because they're all behind the firewall. Right? We hide behind that. And if you've read the news in the last several years, you've seen a lot of brand names being compromised in terms of security. These folks represent, in 2014, over a billion data records were breached uh, from a security compromise. And if you look at the top reasons for security uh, issues, you know, a third of it's employees not taking proper security measures, another third on outside breaches, and then also unpatched uh, servers as well. So a lot of uh, reasons around these security compromises, but security needs to be taken seriously. And that's why you know, DevOps needs to include security as well. There's a talk around DevSecOps as well. And extending security in your culture and the people into the processes as well as into the tooling. So end-to-end -end security uh, in the DevOps environment is very critical. And here are some examples. Uh, does anybody recognize what this is a photo of? Right, this is the uh, latest Intel fab that's being uh, built in Arizona. And the reason I show this is because when I started my career at Intel uh, about 20 years ago, they were going through the Pentium bug. If you recall, the Pentium bug was a floating point unit error in the silicon, and it resulted in a lot of negative PR at Intel. It also uh, resulted in uh, almost a half a billion dollar uh, write off because they had to do a, a recall of the chips. Right? And so this was an inflection point for Intel, and they had to adapt and make a decision. Uh, do they, uh, how can they learn from this, and how can they get better as a company? And so they invested significant dollars in terms of continuous integration and validation of their chip designs 
not in the fab, but in the software factory that front-ended this fab. So as chip designers uh, came up with a new design, their component of the overall chip, they would submit it to this automation uh, cluster, which actually would schedule a job and validate that test or that design with an automated test. Today, they have tens of thousands of systems running these automated uh, batch jobs to validate chips. So continuous integration, a key component. Also, here's another uh, factory. Does anybody recognize what this is a photo of? That's correct. That's the Tesla automobile factory. And the reason I show that is not only is software automating the uh, pipeline in producing these vehicles, but software is having a huge transformation on these vehicles after delivery to the uh, owner. For the first time, you can go to an automobile lot, buy a car, knowing that car will get better 6, 12, 18 months down the road. They're able to send software updates over the wire to the vehicle, improving 0 to 60 time, battery efficiency, or the applications in the center console. How many have heard about a vehicle recall lately in the news for an automobile, right? Seems like every week. What if it was a security issue to an autonomous driving vehicle? Right? You would want a way to deliver a security update quickly uh, to that vehicle. And so continuous delivery capability is a key uh, component uh, of this new software factory that you need to build out. So CI and CD. In the flip side of that, I own a Ford Fusion and just got a recall notice because the network that the onboard cell modem uses is being decommissioned after a certain point. So they will no longer be able to push all of those updates. Um, so you end up shifting to a certain extent where the safety exposure exists into upstream providers in the way. OK. Sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, DevSecOps, uh, you know, uh, the CI-CD pipeline, there are a lot of ways you can go about it in terms of writing scripts, in terms of do it yourself. But what about uh, building that factory out of the box? And that's with a container application platform. And that's what Kubernetes is all about, is automating this software factory, enabling you to have continuous integration and continuous delivery, not only of your software applications, but bug fixes and security updates too and enabling you to deliver these updates in a matter of minutes versus hours or weeks or months uh, that a typical enterprise takes to deliver new capabilities. And so containers are a big part in terms of uh, security because they enable the developer to package in their application with all its immediate dependencies and abstract itself from the underlying host operating system. And this is important because this also allows the operations in the security team to still apply uh, compliance and security rules without uh, encumbering the developer from moving quickly with their application. And so packaging your application once and then being able to deploy it as is in your dev, test, and your production environment is a key part of containers. <laughs> and if you take a look at Linux containers, the basic flow is to build, ship, and run. From a developer perspective, you define a build file with the different components you want to go into the container, it pulls it from a trusted repository, and then out comes a artifact, a container image. You can then share that container image via a registry, whether it's private or public, and then you can apply that artifact to your test environment exactly as it is, or to your production across physical, virtual, private or public cloud infrastructure. And when it comes to this software factory, there are a lot of uh, security aspects in terms of uh, securing and hardening your container environment uh, from images all the way down to the hosts, to network, storage, API, monitoring, and federated clusters. In this talk, I'm going to focus on that top level and talk about uh, contain, securing container images, registry, builds, CI, CD, and the container hosts. So let's start out with the container image security. So first off, as a best practice when it comes to containers and you're building out your applications, 
you want to make sure that you're architecting them uh, in the best way in terms of security is first off, you want to separate, ideally, your code from your configuration and from your data. Right? This allows you to have uh, the ability to deploy these applications without hard coding them with your security configuration or your security uh, data as well. And so you want to make sure uh, that you actually separate these out as best as possible. Now, when it comes to the actual container, uh, when you take a look at the container, whether it's a C application, a Java, a Node.js, or a PHP uh, application, uh, you want to take a look at what's going into uh, these containers. So when you build that container, for instance, if you build the uh, Java application, it'll pull in the JRE, Bash, and glibc. Right? Well, when you pull down that image from your registry, it may have some security issues. Right? In this regards, the JRE, that little triangle has a 66 in it. That means that there's been 66 security notifications for the JRE uh, since RHEL 7.0 was released. All right, so what that means is not only do I need to worry about what's in the container at the time I pull it down into my environment, but I also want to make sure I'm keeping a regular process to scan those images and know what new security issues are popping up because security errata is released all the time. And so you want to make sure that you have a processing in place to actually scan those. Also, uh, as you're deploying these container images out into your environment, you want to make sure that these are trusted uh, images as well. So you want to sign these images and then check that signature as well. Right? So before you run it in your container environment, you want to make sure that it's an authentic uh, image and that it's not being uh, compromised. Also, in terms of container registry security, I right, took a Red Hat scan, the uh, uh, Docker Hub, at one point in time, and found that 64% you know, of the images out on the public hub actually have a critical or medium, or a high, um, high priority or a medium priority uh, security issue. So these are things like Shellshock, Heartbleed, Poodle. Um, and so if your developers are pulling these into the environment, right, you're exposing yourself to a variety of security issues. So you need to work together with operations and have an overall uh, security scanning process. Uh, a good best practice is actually to set up your own private registry in the enterprise. Right? This allows you to control which content is being made available within your enterprise. You also can keep track of uh, the usage of these components as well, and version control, et cetera, within your enterprise, containing uh, custom-made uh, images as well as third party. Right. How do you uh, integrate this with your continuous integration uh, process? So if you look at the typical CI CD process in a containerized based environment, it looks something like this. First off, you have your typical dev, UAT, and production environments. But in the container world, these aren't physical environments. They're actually virtual, right? So your dev environment is a mirror of production. And likewise, your UAT is a mirror of production as well. And containers allow you to set up uh, these virtual environments using your container management platform. Uh, but from a flow perspective, typically your developer checks into a source code management, maybe GitHub. And then that triggers a build of the container image. Well, the container image is built by pulling base images uh, down here and then pulling it and the build image will actually build out the target container image, uh, putting the application along with the application runtime and the dependencies that it needs. And then you'll store that resulting artifact into the image repository. Now, how do you go about uh, managing security of this container image. The container image may have multiple layers. You may have the base image, which is the core operating system. Maybe it's RHEL 7. And then you have your middleware layer. Maybe it's a uh, uh, Tomcat application server. And then the third component would be your actual application. So how do you go from 
the separation of responsibilities today to a container where it's all put together in that container and still have ownership and delegation for security uh, tracking and security updates, et cetera. And so with the, uh, the container build file, you can still have the OS owner uh, specify uh, the operating system component and then the middleware would own that in terms of the application layer. And then the application coder would actually own the application logic that sits on top of that platform. Right? The difference is, instead of using a kickstart file, a tarball, and a jar file, we're now all talking on the same language because we're using the uh, Linux container build file to specify as the blueprint. Right, so this kind of normalizes things and helps bring together these cross-functional teams uh, to be collaborating. Also, with these container models, you can also uh, trigger rebuilds on these layers. And so you could actually watch at any one of these layers, and if there's a dependency downstream, you could trigger an automated rebuild. So maybe there's a security issue in the core build you would want to watch, is there an updated core image upstream in your registry? And if there is, automatically trigger a rebuild of any application that depends on that particular base image. Right? And then you could actually take it to a next level, is then go automatically deploy this into production uh, after it goes through testing uh, with the updated version and security fix. And so, Integrating security scans into your continuous integration pipeline is an important step. Right? So you may want to add an actual step. This is the Jenkins uh, build CICD pipeline. So in build one, build two, build three, you can see as it moves from commit, code review, unit test, we've added a phase for security. And what this does is just run an automated scanning tool, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, to check the container image that was built to make sure it doesn't have any known security vulnerabilities or uh, it uh, makes sure it conforms to the security policy as well. And so how would you go about doing that? To scan for compliance and vulnerability audits, uh, you could use an upstream tool such as OpenSCAP uh, there are other solutions out there. Black Duck Software has one. Uh, Anchor is a, a startup that has a scanner as well. So a lot of tools that are out there. The important thing is that you're integrating some sort of automation into your CI pipeline so that you're scanning for container image issues. And so in the case of OpenSCAP, this upstream utility, it comes with a security uh, guide for the target operating system, which has a a list of uh, security policies. And also, you have the errata in terms of CCE, which tells you uh, specific checklists that the government has issued as far as guidelines for hardening your particular operating system. This may be minimum password length. It may be making sure that legacy services are disabled, like TFTP or something like that. And then also, the government issues CVEs for your target operating system, uh, which are security errata, notifying that particular components in that operating system may have a security issue, what it is, and how to address it. And so that's the content portion of OpenSCAP. There's also a set of tooling available, command line tools, daemons, uh, GUI tools, to actually build the checklist, build the policies, and then also run the scanning and generate uh, reports as well, which we'll, we'll go into. And so that's the third component is the reporting aspect. Uh, so some of the use cases uh, for OpenSCAP uh, are scanning for compliance, right? So are password quality requirements set? Are obsolete services enabled, such as Telnet? Is OpenSSH properly configured? Is slash tip temp on a, a separate partition? And so to use OpenSCAP, you can use the uh, command line utility, and this could be integrated with your CI flow. Uh, when you run it, 
it will give you a list of whether it's passed or failed on the target, whether it's a host operating system, a virtual machine, or a container. And then you'll get a report uh, showing you uh, the uh, status of that scan. Uh, you can then drill down and see the overall scoring. So in this case, uh, there was 34 checks that passed and 33 that failed, uh, three with high priority. And then I can actually drill down and I can see all the different checks that either passed or failed, and I can see what the check was all about. And then I could actually drill down into that check. So in this case, I'm looking at the uh, minimum password length, and I can see that it failed, so it wasn't set properly in the, uh, the image. Uh, but even more importantly, there's a remediation script to rectify this issue on the target image. Another use case is to scan for known vulnerabilities. All right, so this is checking for known security issues. You know, what RPMs need updating, uh, what's the criticality, what's the vulnerability, and what CVEs haven't been applied yet. And so, likewise, you can run a command line scan, and it will go through all the known security vulnerabilities and see if that target has any positives. And so after that, you can go into the HTML report and see a summary of the scan. And then you can see a list of each individual failure and see what the uh, actual issue is. And then you could actually update your system as well. Uh, in terms of containers specifically, it allows you to see is the Docker image compliant or is the Docker container Compliant. So this is offline or online, right? the container at rest or actually running on a particular host system. And so there's some scan commands you can actually run and see if an offline image has a known vulnerability or a security issue against your policy. And then likewise, if they're actually running on a target system, you could use this to see it in real time if they have any issues as well. And so that's uh, the open scap. There's also a GUI workbench for a variety of operating systems where you can define uh, your policy and your checklist uh, so that you can either remove or add particular checks depending on what your particular security policy is at your enterprise. Uh, there's also an add-on. So if you're building target Linux systems, uh, you can, with Anaconda, you can actually add this on. For instance, if you did a default install, uh, actually only got a 64% score, versus if you ran this uh, test, it basically got 100% almost in terms of being compliant. Also, you know, we talked about continuous integration. What about continuous delivery with containers? So here we're focusing more on the, the right side, getting the uh, new, com new uh, capability, moving it from source code into dev, into UAT, into production. So how do I do that in a consistent, reliable, automated manner uh, with containers? And how does that look? Well, typically, you know, in a, a, a typical CI, CD with uh, a, a non-containerized application, you move the jar file uh, from development and to test and to production, and then with a container image, Right, with that same application, you're actually moving the whole image file. So you build it once and then deploy everywhere. So I build it in development, and then I take that exact image that the developers built and then move it into QA staging and then production. Right, so QA isn't rebuilding and they're not reconfiguring it. They're not rebuilding or reconfiguring in, in production either. And so if you're using something like Jenkins and Kubernetes, uh, you can actually uh, leverage the built-in capabilities to do uh, deployments. And there are a few different deployment strategies that are built in out of the box with Kubernetes. Uh, one is a rolling update deployment. So this is when you have a cluster of your application, version one, version one, and version one on three different hosts, multiple instances of that container. 
and you want to deploy the new version 1.2. Well, in test, I've created a virtual instance of my test environment and running those tests. And then within Kubernetes, I don't have to script this, I can just issue a command and it'll actually do a rolling update of my production environment. So think about this security patch, I need to quickly get it out there and roll that update across my cluster without bringing it down. And so I could do that by automatically updating my load balancer as each host is updated uh, with the new version. Uh, so that's an, a rolling update. Also another deployment strategy is the blue-green. Right, this is where instead of doing a rolling update of in place, you actually have one virtual instance of this cluster running version one and a security issue comes out and you want to roll that out quickly. Well, instead of updating the existing environment, you just create this whole new virtual environment for this new version with the up updated security patch. And so after the security patch goes through uh, dev, test, it's now coming into production. So here it's being tested. And so Kubernetes created this whole cluster for version 1.2 and then the old cluster is still virtually there. So if there was an issue, I could actually roll back to that cluster just by updating the software load balancer. Uh, so those are uh, blue-green testing and rolling updates for deployment strategies uh, in your container farm to deploy those security patches quickly. Uh, next, let's talk about the container runtime security. So this is a key component. You have these images that have been scanned and ready for production, and you want to make sure that they're running in a secure environment. So here's some best practices around running your uh, container images on a container host in your cluster. Uh, first off, you know, uh, try not to run this container image as root, right? If the, there is a security issue uh, and, and within the container that's running as root, it can get access to the host, then it's also root, and then it could get into other containers as well. Also, you wanna limit SSH access uh, to your container images try to access anything through an API, right? If you need logs, if you need any information from these containers, try to have a uh, API access, so ssh -less. Also, you wanna use uh, namespaces uh, as well uh, to set up nice isolation and separation. Uh, you wanna define resource quotas, right? So you don't have the noisy neighbor consuming uh, resources, whether it's storage, network, or CPU or memory. And then also, uh, you wanna enable logging, right? So Kubernetes has a, a way to actually turn on logging and aggregate that logging so you can put it into Splunk or, or whatever uh, viewing system you like to analyze that. And then that will help you identify security issues. It can be a proactive notification. Uh, also, you wanna have a best practice around applying security errata, not just to the container images, but also the container hosts in your uh, cluster. Uh, so it's very important that you have a standard procedure for that as well. And then also apply security context and set comp filter. So uh, Kubernetes out of the box allows you to apply these capabilities so that you limit what a container can do on the host in terms of uh, kernel access. Um, and so that will provide an extra level of security for you and ensure uh, that if there are security issues within the uh, container image, it will help minimize uh, the authority and the access that they have um, in that compromise. So that will be limiting uh, those breaches. So in summary, in terms of securing your container environment, you know, we talked about container scanning, uh, a really a critical thing to implement and integrate into your CI CD process. Uh, above and beyond that, there are different aspects of, in Kubernetes that allow you to have security control around network isolation with network namespaces. Um, also storage with the ability to 
mount both local and shared storage, applying quotas and access controls to that storage so that containers can only access uh, what they're authorized to from a storage perspective as very important as you uh, move your brownfield applications into a container environment. Also, as we go to an API world where everything has an API, you know, how are we controlling access to these APIs? How are we limiting uh, the volume of requests from a quality of service perspective? Uh, so there's some uh, capabilities around that. You know, centralized monitoring and logging to help with your security uh, proactiveness. Uh, that you can get visibility into potential issues based on uh, trends. And then also, you know, leveraging cluster federation to isolate uh, applications from one another and even enabling you to run one cluster, a part of a cluster in uh, public cloud and maybe a, another cluster in, uh, in the private cloud and being able to have a, a aggregated central uh, API around those multiple clusters. Uh, so this is uh, securing your container environment, and that's all I had for today. And I want to thank you for attending today's session. Uh, that's my email address. Feel free to send any emails if you have any questions. I'm also on uh, LinkedIn under uh, Chris Vantine, uh, and I'll be around after the session if you'd like to ask any questions. So thank you so much.